Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I wish there were more of us, but that's people are busy even with Zoom. I know. <laughs> people are. So um, anyway, Connie, would you introduce sure. Michael officially to our group? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Michael Broad is, I, I have heard about Michael for years from Sherry. <laughs> She talked about every time the topic of energy efficiency. I didn't even know what Environmental Defense Fund was. And because of Sherry's talking about Michael and the good work that they were doing and he was doing through them, I am and I give a bunch of money. Mm. Well, not a bunch. For me, it's a bunch of money. I can mm -hmm. give my hundred bucks a year um, and have it for a number of years now just because I think that the kind if if they're supporting somebody like michael uh or at least were then that's something that i want to support too so right now what michael is is a project manager at new ecology incorporated based in boston massachusetts and that's where he's coming to us from boston and sherry is coming to us from yonkers new york so we are hoping the storm that is barreling down on them lets us finish this. Uh, as project ma manager, Michael consults on energy efficiency and sustainability for the construction of new multifamily housing developments, uh, as uh, he does this as well for renovation of existing buildings. Uh, this work includes achieving LEED, Passive House, and Enterprise Green Communities certif certifications zoning regulations, compliance related to sustainability, tech reviews of building designs, a variety of other services. He's got considerable experience managing water and energy audits in which he develops recommendations for cost-effective green upgrades uh, for multifamily buildings throughout New England. Prior to this job, uh, he was the EDF Climate Corps Fellow at Boston Housing Authority and he quantified the energy savings from two public housing developments that were recently renovated using lead and green design principles. Mr. Broad lives in Boston with his wife and new baby. In his spare time, if there is any with a new baby, he enjoys hiking and playing classical guitar. Welcome, mm. Michael. And yeah. I have made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen without, without much trouble. And what I just should have said, uh, we have been uh, for the last month and this month talking about energy efficiency because energy making all of our buildings more efficient is a is is very good way to cut down on carbon pollution. And it's something we can probably get bipartisan support on. So this is a really important topic. And now it's your turn, Michael. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. uh, let me make sure I can share the screen. Let me just set this up here. Sharing screen. I believe that is the right move. Uh... Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, does everybody see um, slides? Yes. Um, yep. The very first one. Mm -hmm. You don't see the presentation mode, right? Like with my notes on the side, you no. can see. The no, we're, we're seeing yes. what we should. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for, for having me to to uh, to speak with you today. I'm excited to, to share a little bit about what I do. Um, this presentation went through a few different incarnations in speaking with, with uh, Connie's um, together. Um, and what um, what I have for you today, I think is, it's supposed to kind of uh, build on and dovetail with the presentation that you uh, saw last time, which uh, I understand went through um, various measures that are applicable to residential buildings. You know, I think they covered um, uh, solar PV, they covered uh, electric vehicles a little bit, they covered um, air source heat pumps. Um, so technologies and upgrades that can be had or implemented at the the level of a residence or level of a building. Um, so this presentation I, I'm hoping will build additional context on top of that very kind of fine grained view of what can be done. Um, so um, some fundamentals are here, some 
I have a few a section on uh, uh, kind of hot topics in sustainability issues that are being discussed um, and kind of the new frontiers in, in the field uh, with regard to the built environment, sustainability in the built environment. And then, um, and then uh, at the end, I'm hoping that uh, we can have a little bit of time to talk about energy audits. I know that that was a topic that uh, you wanted to cover um, depending on how, how much time is there. But ideally, you know, this, this presentation can, be, um, can inform you as you think about what kind of, what kind of advocacy you want to do, if that's the, the direction you take or what kind of program you want to try to implement um, in, in your region of Arizona. I should say right now that I am obviously not from Arizona. I have never lived there. And um, so I've tried to tailor the presentation as much as possible to Arizona, but I'm not, to be frank, I'm not an expert in all things sustainability in Arizona specifically. So mm -hmm. um, my knowledge has some limits uh, with regard to what I'm gonna present to you today. But that's uh, enough about that for now. Let me move on to the first slide. So this, this is uh, the, the contents of this presentation. So I wanted to cover um, sustainability, sustainable building standards first and foremost and try to give you an idea of the kind of framework that they provide for thinking about site uh, building sustainability and site sustainability. And then as I mentioned, uh, hot topics in sustainability for the built environment. So those, those big issues that are being discussed vigorously right now in the field um, and are kind of the new frontiers. Mm. And then, as I said, energy audits for if we have time. Okay, so um, sustainable building standards. So there are a few that I wanted to cover. The famous one that you probably all have heard of is LEED or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Um, this, uh, well, th the other two that I want to cover in some detail are Passive House, which is uh, up and coming. It's, it's relatively new on the scene in the last five or something you could say 10 years. Um, and then Net Zero, which is not exactly a certification or a standard, but it's uh, a concept that is um, being uh, discussed in detail right now. And then a few others we'll touch on briefly. Uh, shit. Michael, I accidentally muted you, sorry. Can you unmute yourself? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, now you're good. Okay, great. So LEED, LEED is the, um, the, the kind of bread and butter design standard for, for buildings in the United States or North America. Um, it, was, it came into play roughly 20 years ago or so, was the earliest incarnation of it. And it has since, um, it, it's drawn a lot of criticism for, from some circles, but it undeniably has changed the way that the construction, building construction uh, industry has operated in the building design industry, the architects have thought about uh, building sustainability. So it has to be given credit for, for really being a paradigm shift in, in how we think about um, the design of buildings. Um, it is a design standard. That's one thing to know about it. So it, it doesn't necessarily cover operations of a building. Um, uh, so obviously you, you spend time designing the building, then you build the building, and then the building is in place and operating, um, consuming energy, consuming water um, uh, for decades, really, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And so um, the, a large portion of the energy consumption in a building happens during, um, during operations. This system does not cover that. This is just about the design uh, up front. So, um, it's divided into various facets here that are listed uh, on the slide, and I'll just touch on each of them. Uh, location, transportation, and connectivity. So this is about where to put your building, essentially, and how to connect it with the uh, surrounding area. Um, LEED has drawn some criticism in the past because um, you can put a LEED label on a building for a building that you build out 30 miles from any population center, um, nowhere close to where people live, nowhere close to where there are other shops and, and restaurants and whatever. And so if you need, <clears throat> excuse me, if you need to commute to 
um, to a lead building, it's not necessarily going to actually end up saving energy or saving um, or being a, a, a positive benefit to the environment because you're consuming so much energy driving there every day. Um, so, but this section is intended to uh, discourage that. You're, you're, you're given points um, through the system to locate within a larger network of, um, of urban connectivity of near the restaurants, near the uh, public transportation, um, near bike paths and, and all those kinds of things. So there are a variety of credits in this section that um, promote that. So sustainable site is next. And uh, these are things like within the parcel of land itself, um, uh, credits that emphasize um, sustainable design of landscaping, uh, low uh, efficient uh, irrigation design, um, installation of drought tolerant plants or, or plants that are appropriate for your particular ecology, um, uh, aspects like that, that make sure that, um, that you don't end up um, you know, over consuming on the site itself outside of the boundaries of the building. So water efficiency is, is pretty self-explanatory. I'm guessing uh, people, folks in Arizona could talk about water efficiency up and down probably more than I can. Um, points available for efficient water fixtures for more advanced systems like uh, rainwater catchment um, uh, for uh, appropriate sub-metering of water systems in buildings to understand what, uh, where the water is going essentially. Um, and then same for energy efficiency. So this is, this is one of the major emphases of, of LEED, um, promotion of energy efficient design. So a high performance envelope, um, high efficiency windows that don't transfer much heat. Um, excuse, excuse me, um, uh, high efficiency mechanicals and appropriately sized mechanicals so that you're not oversizing your, your um, mechanical system uh, against what the, uh, what the loads of the building are. Um, points for um, appropriate startup um, and the calibration of the mechanical systems when you first uh, install them so that they actually operate the way that they're intended to operate. So those kinds of things are uh, in energy efficiency. And materials and resources covers um, emissions of uh, various chemicals from materials that are installed in the building and how we can curtail that, among other things. And I'll touch on a little bit on that later. Indoor environmental quality is uh, largely about ventilation, appropriate ventilation, and making sure that, um, uh, that even despite that it can, um, it can sometimes lead to a larger consumption of energy, more consumption of energy in a building, um, indoor air quality, indoor environmental health is, is still something that needs to be strongly emphasized. And so this is contained in that one. And then awareness and education is just an aspect of LEED that, in which you, um, you get points for promoting sustainability to others and to the building occupants. So this framework applies to the other, um, the other certifications that I'm going to talk about. Uh, in that sense, LEED is the kind of the pioneer in, in categorizing these different things. Um, but uh, I think that's the broad summary that I wanted to give on LEAD for now. Uh, so LEAD is uh, a points-based system. And it, as you can see, you, it's divided up into four different tiers of performance. So you can get certified um, at the base level, um, which I, can you see my mouse? I think you're able to see the mouse. Um, the base level is, is certified. It's 40 to 49 points. Uh, silver, gold, and then platinum. Platinum being the highest tier and very difficult to achieve uh, if you get 80 plus points in the most recent version of LEED. So that's how that, that structure works. So the next standard is Passive House. Um, Passive House is relatively new on the scene. It's, it's just in the last five-ish years. Um, Passive House emphasizes deep reductions in energy consumption in the building, especially heating and cooling consumption. So um, whereas before LEED emphasized those six or seven different tiers, kind of a comprehensive look at sustainability, all aspects of the, of the uh, sustainability on the site, Passive House really emphasizes energy consumption and tries to drive it way down. Um, 
to almost as far as we can go with it in, in practical terms nowadays. Um, there's two different institutes that certify for passive house and they're historically they are at odds. They, there's, a, there's a dispute between them and they, they don't really like each other very much. FIAS, which is uh, this one here, is the more prevalent one in the United States. Um, so if you see FIAS, um, you'll know that uh, it's a passive house certified building. Um, it's generally more impactful in um, buildings that, in places where building loads are higher. So in, um, in colder climates or more humid climates, that is where there's more opportunity essentially to, to reduce energy consumption because the baseline is that we need to use more energy to heat the buildings in places like, um, I have this map here of Arizona. In Arizona, you have four different climate zones. Um, the United States is divided up into climate zones uh, based on prevalent weather patterns and, and, and average temperatures. And uh, as you can see in Southern Arizona, you're in climate zone two, um, which is comparatively, uh, in terms of heating, it's, uh, it's comparatively mild. Uh, I know that it gets cold there in the winter during the night, but um, compared to other areas of the country, the heating requirements for a building are pretty low. Um, in Northern Arizona, in climate zone five, the reverse is true. So um, passive house is going to be more relevant in other parts of the state, I had to be honest. Um, but I thought it's still worth conveying to you and making you aware of what it is because it's, it's, a, it's a fashionable and very up and coming important um, certification to be aware of. And I should say, um, I know that we talked about um, questions at the end, but I'm happy to entertain questions at any time, if that's okay with you. If, or unless, I'll leave it up to the moderators, but um, I'm fine answering questions as we go either way. So Passive House emphasizes, as I said, um, different aspects of uh, the building's design that really focus on heating and cooling consumption. So uh, making sure that we optimize um, installation of windows so that we uh, make most use of the sun and retain the sun's heat. Um, uh, we wanna install a very highly insulated envelope with very minimal bridging through the envelope, uh, heat loss through, through framing and things like that. Um, windows uh, should also be high performance in terms of um, their ability to limit heat transfer. This is number three here. <clears throat> Number four is airtight enclosure. So in, uh, an envelope performs well, not only because of its high insulation value, but also because it's airtight. So you know, a, a large portion of the heat transfer through an envelope is due to air movement, um, not necessarily convective transfer. So you can have a very well insulated envelope, but if you don't actually um, patch up the air leaks, you're still gonna lose a lot of heat. Um, or, or gain a lot of heat in the summer, as it were, depending on what season. So um, making an envelope very airtight is the other part of making it uh, perform well. To do that, we need to, um, you know, if you have a very tight envelope, you uh, end up, you know, risking poor air quality inside the building. So, um, so you need to install uh, balanced ventilation as well, high performance ventilation to make sure that you're exchanging uh, fresh air interior to out to exterior and vice versa in an efficient manner. And then um, high performance, uh, high performance mechanical equipment, as I mentioned before. Um, Michael, I didn't realize I was muted. Why don't we, oh, you have, see if there are any questions at this point before you go further. There was um, one going back to, um, lead and about where things were located. So I'm backtracking a little uh, about location. It was, well, you know, it looks with that standard, you know, it, it would seem, the question is, it seems locations that are close to transportation and shops are mostly urban areas that are already built up. So how does this standard, I guess, fit in with that? You know, if you're, <laughs> if you can, only build where things are only built up to, to meet the standard. How does yeah. how do you overcome that? I guess. I mean, that, I think that's a good question. That's 
that is really the goal of what they're trying to get to with lead. They're, they're encouraging infill. They're encouraging mm -hmm. um, reuse of, of parcels that have already been developed. Mm -hmm. So if you have a situation where there's an old, um, you know, a, a, a commercial site that, um, that has been abandoned for five years and nobody's really using mm -hmm. it or, uh, or something of that nature, uh, the system incentivizes a developer to come along and buy that up and, and either renovate it or knock it down and build new uh -huh. rather than build out um, on a completely new parcel of land that's never been developed. Right. Um, so they are, they are deliberately encouraging density um, mm -hmm. in that manner. Okay. And all of these lead and passive, well, lead particularly, is, is all of this optional for the building and it's just that then you can you know have bragging rights and say <laughs> or for the people who are building it say yeah. we're building it up to this standard or it's a good question so it depends on where you where you live where you're developing um in the city of boston where i am there is a zoning ordinance that requires some level of lead for all new construction over a certain oh. size over fifty thousand mm -hmm. square feet um and so um every new construction in the city uh, over 50,000 needs to demonstrate compliance with the lead checklist. Mm. Um, if you go out to another part of Massachusetts, um, you're not gonna find that. It's, it's at this stage, uh, purely a city by city uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So um, in Arizona, you may or may not have that, that same situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I almost remember seeing this, if you went to some new, new development, new residential development, they might advertise and brag that we're platinum lead or, you know, yeah, that they, they have, have yeah, yeah, for home buyers. Okay. Certainly All there's right. the builder down here that um, is lead certified and that is a big part of how he introduces himself as mm -hmm. a lead certified builder because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a feather in his cap. Um, and I know of one little development they planned and then it the kind of, they lost their shirts uh, when the 2008 collapse happened, but they tried really, you know, their, their plans included that location, transportation, connectivity. It included, you know, a lot of houses, but it also had a little village center. You know, it mm -hmm. had a little um, community gathering room, a place where you could come together and have potluck. And there was going to be a little mail place where you could pick up your mail and get coffee from a little cart. And, you know, it was just, and I think that's a new way of thinking about communities is that you build them so that you can that you bring people together instead of isolate them in their houses and require that they use cars, which is the way everything's been built so far. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. Right. Okay. That's right. All right. Okay. Sorry. I brought you backwards, but. <laughs> well, I wanted to add something to the, yeah. um, the next slide, I think. Uh, uh, the one yeah. that had the Arizona. Yeah. No, beyond that. Uh, that had the the sun coming in the windows of that house. Oh, yeah. Uh, here. I think it's made. There you go. Mm -hmm. So the um, that's actually good here too because um, if you're designing for passive solar, you get sun in the winter time, and you don't get any sun on that same glass in the summertime. And winters can be a little bit cold here. We're not nearly as cold as you know most of the rest of the world, but but we get kind of chilly and I've got a porch that's got big glass in it. And I didn't know about passive solar houses when we when we added that glass section in our porch. It made itself well known. It is a lovely room on days like today. It's a sunny day. It's cold outside. There's a little bit of wind. I'm heating the rest of my house by opening up that room and mm -hmm. blowing, you know, turning the fan on and just blowing the 73 degrees air in there into my 68 degrees house. And um, so this passive, uh, I, there's even some advantages for that down here. If I ever build a house, it will be designed passive solar. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. The um, there are 
there's a little bit of a distinction between passive house and passive solar. So I think what you're uh, saying is passive solar. Mm -hmm. um, and I would absolutely agree that in, in sunny and sometimes cold places like Arizona, it makes total sense to do that, um, to, to passive solar. Um, passive house um, is the more, I guess it, it emphasizes these other features as well. And so it's not, mm -hmm necessarily true in Southern Arizona that you want a, a very, very highly insulated envelope. Um, uh, just because it's not necessarily needed, uh, to be honest, but, but uh, mm -hmm. passive solar is something that absolutely you can take advantage of down there. Passive solar in that sense is kind of a, a subcomponent of the passive house strategy. Got it. And, yeah. um, you may want to use okay. it in some places and, and, and not in others. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to jump to here. Um, Let's see, I'm at 22 minutes already, okay. No, don't worry about okay. it. We've got a small group, so we're not gonna have to divide up. We will stick together okay. to have our discussion. Okay. So you take okay. what you need. This is, this is yeah. interesting. This is so yeah. net zero, um, that is, this is the, the next thing, I guess, but beyond even Passive House. And it builds on Passive House because um, it, it doesn't take, once, once you're a, a Passive House design building, you are only a little bit removed from net zero. Um, the question is, what does net zero really mean? And there's historically, there's been a lot of variation in definitions. People are tossing out the term net zero, but not necessarily clearly defining it. Um, so, uh, you know, some people say net zero emissions in which you are, um, in which over the course of the year, emissions um, attributable to a building are, are basically zero. They're netted out. Um, uh, between the loads, between the consumption in the building and uh, purchase of credits or, or on-site on generation. Net zero energy is similar, but your, your metric is kilowatt hours and, and therms of gas. <clears throat> um, and then we have uh, zero energy ready, which is another term, but separate from net zero. Zero energy ready, um, the US DOE has a standard by which you basically you drive down the loads in the building, you make it a, an efficient performing building, and then um, install the infrastructure for solar PV and get it ready for solar if in mm. the future you decide to install solar. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, uh, and then ascend, you know, it, it'll be ready to go to zero at some point when you decide to, mm. to um, take that last step. Mm. So um, there are, Various different definitions out there, they don't all necessarily correspond, but, um, but they're slowly becoming harmonized. And I just uh, encourage if you think about this to, to make sure you understand what specifically mm. they're talking about. Um, the basic principle of net zero is that <clears throat> you use those principles I mentioned before in Passive House, those five or six different principles to minimize consumption of, the, of, the, of energy in the building itself. And then you install renewables on site to get you um, hopefully the rest of the way there, solar PV on the roof, sometimes solar thermal to offset a portion of your domestic hot water consumption. Mm -hmm. um, and in small scale properties in, in single family homes and townhomes, you can usually get all the way there. You can get to net zero simply with a large solar system on the roof. Um, as you start scaling up and the properties become a little bit bigger, the density of the building, the, of the loads relative to the area available for solar um, increases. And so um, you eventually need to start offsetting that remainder, not by uh, solar PV on site alone, but also by purchase of renewable energy credits. So mm -hmm. the bigger building you have, the more likely you have a situation where you can't rely just on site level solar, I guess is the moral of the story. Um, so you need to turn to um, more, um, a less tangible form of, of offset, which is uh, a credit. Uh, I'm just for time's sake, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on these. Um, Enterprise Green Communities is another certification. Um, it's very much focused on affordable housing. So um, if you, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm having trouble here. Um, let me just mute myself a second.
if you have any um, goals for, for your organization related to affordable housing and sustainability, consider looking at enterprise green communities. Um, they have tailored their certification system. They've modeled it on LEED. So they have those six or seven different categories, broad, um, comprehensive look at sustainability, but they have tailored it for the uh, situation uh, in affordable housing specifically. So um, it's a little bit more uh, feasible for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Living building challenge over here on the right is a, a very niche and um, advanced form of certification. Again, structured on the same six categories as LEED, but pushing the envelope very far. So there are a very small number of buildings that are Living Building Challenge certified in the country, uh, precisely because it's very aggressive. Um, and I, to be honest, I have basically no experience with it, so I don't know if I can go into much detail, uh, but just be aware of it. It's, um, if you're looking for the, a real challenge, look at that one. So this is the hot topics portion of the, um, of the presentation. Uh, any, any questions on the certification so far? Okay. Um, electrification. So um, this is a big deal right now. Uh, if, if we are interested in getting to um, net zero uh, in the form of a country <laughs> to, to, bring our, to bring the United States to uh, eliminate greenhouse gas emissions, part, part of what we need to do is eliminate consumption of fossil fuels. And the rationale for electrification is to uh, remove um, use of gas or sometimes use of propane uh, at the level of the site. Um, so in principle, that is what's shown on this slide. So converting gas furnaces to air source heat pumps. And I think that might've been discussed potentially last presentation. Um, I understand that in Arizona, there's a large number of air source heat pumps already in use, which is uh, in that sense, a good thing. Um, converting gas tank water heaters to uh, electric water heaters. And sorry for this, this got a little uh, skewed with the formatting, but um, they do have heat pump water heaters available, which is basically a tank water heater with a heat pump plopped on top of it. And the heat pump uh, is doing the heating of the water. Um, and they also have electric tank water heaters as well. So both of those options are out there um, uh, to replace your gas appliance. Uh, and then the last here is a gas range or oven. Um, I don't know how many of those are in use in Arizona, but if they are, obviously the options are to convert to electric range or induction range uh, if, if you want to spend more money because those are expensive. So that, that's the basic concept of electrification. There are a lot of considerations to think about. Um, the first one being, why are you doing this? Why are you electrifying? Um, are you doing it to um, save money or are you doing it to save or reduce carbon emissions? If it's the first one, if it's saving money, um, it's not necessarily the case, not necessarily the case that that will actually accomplish your goal. Um, and that is the, for the reason of uh, what's in this box here. Uh, I, I borrowed some rates uh, for electricity and for gas that I think are roughly corresponding to what you pay in Southern Arizona. Um, and um, at, that, at those rates, electricity is three, about three and a half times the, the price of gas uh, on a per BTU basis when you break it down to the common unit of energy between the two. Um, and so converting from gas to electricity is going to raise your, your utility bills. That's a big challenge right now for folks who are talking about uh, uh, um, electrification um, and run into the argument of what, why would we do something that costs us more uh, as we operate the building. Um, it's to, to, to some degree offset by the improved efficiency of the electric equipment. The heat pumps are more efficient than the gas appliances but it doesn't completely offset. So you may actually result, in, you may actually see an increase in your utility bills if you were to do this. Um, the other thing is uh, to consider your electric grid mix. I have a, actually I'll just jump ahead right now. Um, uh, yeah. So your electric grid in Arizona, according to the EIA, 
uh, is roughly composed of this, uh, ha about half natural gas, about, uh, about a quarter nuclear and some coal and then uh, other renewables. Um, whether you, if you convert from gas on site to electricity on site, you are basically moving that electric consumption to this, uh, to roughly speaking, this uh, mix of fuels. And so you are now, um, you are uh, essentially taking that consumption and applying half of, uh, half of it to gas and half of it to nuclear and 17% and to coal-fired, et cetera. There's transmission losses which complexify the situation, but in, in simple terms, that's what happens. So um, it's not always a given everywhere that um, electrification actually has significant carbon impacts. In Arizona, you know, with, a, with a, about a half of the grid uh, gas, I would expect it to, to be okay, but figuring that out exactly is beyond the scope of this presentation. And so I don't know exactly what would happen, um, whether you would actually save carbon or not. Um, you can always, whether or not, um, oh, well, if you, if you do convert to electricity, you can uh, offset that grid mix that I showed you uh, with solar PV plus batteries. I understand that in Arizona, solar PV is a very contentious thing and, and there's battles going on and there have been for years on that. But uh, if you ever get to the stage where solar PV is easy to install, then electrifying plus installing solar is the ideal. That's what, that's what the end game is from our perspective. Um, because that ultimately is removing all sources of fossil fuel. There's a dog upstairs that's howling. Apologies for that, <laughs> uh, if you hear that there. Mm -hmm. And then the refrigerants. So um, all heat pumps have refrigerants in them. All AC systems have refrigerants in them. And um, refrigerants have in themselves a significant global warming impact. So if they're released into the atmosphere, um, they are in some cases many times as potent green greenhouse gas um, uh, uh, gases, I guess, uh, as carbon dioxide. So proper management of refrigerants mm -hmm. and um, at the end of life of a piece of equipment is, is critical because otherwise you can undo what you were mm -hmm. seeking to do. Mm -hmm. We'll cover that. Uh, materials and health. So, uh, well, any questions on electrification? Okay. Uh, materials and health. So this is just uh, something to, to understand. So there's an ongoing area of research. There are tons and tons of materials that are installed in buildings and they all are uh, manufactured to some degree with chemicals, um, or at least most of them are. And so um, the question is basically how harmful are those chemicals? What's the uh, mm -hmm. risk of those chemicals off gassing in the, in the building mm -hmm. and doing damage to people's health? Um, mm -hmm. The table that's here is just a very brief summary of some of the more, more prominent uh, issues that's out there. Um, volatile organic compounds, formaldehyde, flame retardants, and phthalates um, can have all these impacts on uh, occupants of the buildings. And, and there's many, many others that are, uh, you know, concerning as well. Um, so this is, uh, you know, I think if you're interested in talking about how to limit um, harmful chemicals in your, in your building, mm -hmm. um, the red list, which is from the living building challenge that I mentioned before, is uh, one place to start. It's very stringent. It's very aggressive. As I mentioned, that standard is aggressive. Um, and uh, it's, it functions on the principle that if there is, if there is any concern about um, um, harmful impacts on humans, then we should just eliminate it. We shouldn't wait for you know, 20 years for um, multiple studies to occur and have somebody finally conclude that it is harmful. We should just, we should just go ahead and, and uh, avoid it. Um, so in that sense, it's very aggressive, but it's a good place to start to learn about harmful uh, materials if you're interested. Embodied carbon. Um, and I am coming Michael, up. Michael, we've got yes. a question. Yeah. Uh, this is from Guy Nelson, who was a guy that talked last time. Guy, I didn't see you come in. Welcome. 
Uh, he said, is the monthly meter charge that the gas utility bills the customer significant? The utility charges it regardless of whether or not you use gas that month. Michael, if you want to, I mean, um, Guy, if you want to unmute yourself and ask that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I was just wondering, Michael, if, you know, the, the meter charges are different for different utilities. But uh, is it significant enough to say in the summer months when very little gas is going to be used uh, for heating, uh, the, the meter charge is still going to be there that month? Yeah, you know, utility uh, meter charges, they do vary, as, as you've uh, said. In my area, I can speak to, to New England and Massachusetts. I have typically seen um, roughly $20, $20 a month uh, for a utility charge, a, a meter charge. So you're right that if um, you use basically zero gas uh, at any period in the, in the year, you'd still pay $20 a month. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, if you did, that would be an additional savings. If you, uh, if you decided to electrify your building, you would um, be able to close that account, uh, shut down that meter um, and, uh, and avoid those charges. Not all that much uh, savings in that particular case, but uh, it's something. Mm -hmm. All right, so the other hot topic that I wanted to cover is embodied carbon. So um, this is like the next frontier. Um, this is essentially what this is, is when we have a building that's constructed, um, all those materials that are being installed in the building, they are being manufactured somewhere. Uh, whether they are wood that's growing in a forest and then being processed in a mill, or if it's steel uh, in a, in a um, steel mill, or if it's flooring, uh, or you know the couch that you put in the lobby, all those things are manufactured um, and they all therefore require inputs of energy and uh, and inputs of, in a sense, inputs of carbon dioxide or emissions result from their manufacture. So that's the, um, that's the term embodied carbon in a, in a particular material product. Um, and so we could, we could you know, eliminate 90% of the energy consumption in a building uh, in terms of operations, in terms of the utility uh, month to month bills um, but we still have all this stuff around us that was um, manufactured and therefore carbon is in the atmosphere as a result of our building. So, um, you know, estimates that I've seen um, vary widely, but uh, anywhere from 30% to, depending on the, the life of the building, anywhere from 30 to 90% of the uh, carbon um, resulting from a building is in the embodied carbon. Um, so it can be significant. Mm. And so um, th this is, everybody's looking at this right now. There's a lot of analysis going on. There's not a lot of consensus. Uh, so it's, a, it's an emerging thing, but just to give you a sample, um, steel versus wood framing. So any given building, um, you know, residential buildings were typically using wood, but uh, if you're getting uh, larger, then sometimes you end up with a steel, or at least a portion of it's steel framing. And um, rule of thumb, a ton of steel is roughly equivalent to a ton of CO2 emissions. Depends on where you manufacture it and how far it has to get to the site. But um, that is, uh, it gives you an order of magnitude understanding. Um, so um, obviously steel is, is pretty energy intensive to manufacture. If you're buying your steel from China, um, it's gonna be more impactful than if it came from somewhere in North America. Um, and then the other alternative, wood. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether wood is better than steel for framing a building. Um, people are talking about building high rise uh, buildings out of wood now. So you have a 10 or even 15 story completely wood frame building, which is up until recently not allowed by code. Um, but the, um, the people are trying to get there because they think that uh, it's going to, you know, eliminate use of steel and, and reduce carbon emissions. Again, it's it, the life cycle analyses for that are are in dispute, but um, but potentially we're going there. Yeah, but we have oh, we have a few questions. Mm 
Um, let's see. So this has been over a little bit of time. So let me just ask him in order. <clears throat> is it difficult or expensive to convert a gas furnace to a heat pump? What, what's, the, what's the procedure? How do you do that? So um, it's a good question. So you have, um, if, you have, if you're using a gas furnace, then you have existing ductwork that you're relying on. So you're pushing warm air throughout your, uh, your house um, with that existing ductwork. And in that sense, the infrastructure is already there for, um, some of the infrastructure is already there for, for the heat pump. Um, uh, converting from a gas furnace to a heat pump, the, the heat pump kind of looks, and, and others may be able to speak to this too, but the heat pump kind of looks like a large version of your AC condenser. So it sits outside in the same in the same place as where your AC condenser is. It's a little bit larger. Um, the refrigerant lines go in. Um, they connect to an indoor um, um, uh, uh, unit, and uh, there's a blower in there, and it blows the the uh, conditioned air across the refrigerant coils and into the rest of your house. So the uh, the answer in terms of difficulty is not as difficult as it could be otherwise, since you already have part of what you need there. In terms of cost, um, you know, again, I don't know if I can speak to Arizona, but um, conversion over here is going to be, um, depending on the size of your house, you know, on the order of eight to $10,000 or so. Uh, don't quote me on that because there's a lot of factors that are involved. Uh, but uh, and then you would want to factor in any incentives that are available too, but that's an order of magnitude. I just put a heat pump in, in um, my own place. Now I wasn't converting from gas. I was converting from probably an older heat pump, but it was a very old system. And so I, what I think I, uh, and it cost, that was the general ballpark. My, I have a little bit smaller house. So it's only like six or 7,000 and I could have gotten even more energy efficient. It would have been 12,000. So mm -hmm. I kind of picked something that was medium, but um, everything I read was that if your system is kind of old, even if you've got an electric system, it's worth uh, changing it to something a little bit newer because you're going to get so much better um um, bang for your buck with your electric bill. I mean, my bill went down considerably once I did that. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Connie, Michael, uh, this is Marshall Magruder. I'd like to talk about this conversion because sure. I've done it. Uh, our utility company, Unisource, will give you a n up to $900 uh, rebate for conversion of, to an Energy Star heat pump when you retire an older system. Uh, and they'll also give you up to $650 for the purchase and installation of a heat pump. Um, in addition, they have another uh, rebate for up to $300 for duct sealing inspection mm -hmm. and fixing. The, I, when I had this done, I had my ducts checked. One duct was leaking at 300 cubic feet a minute. They put some glue in the, that, an aerosol glue in the duct and it, covered up the holes. And when they finished, it leaked zero cubic feet per minute. And I'm not trying to cool the Arizona atmosphere with my <laughs> air conditioner yes. or right. with my heat pump. Uh, mm -hmm. Both of those are very uneconomical events. So mm -hmm. duck sealing is a very mm -hmm. important uh, little thing that you don't even think about. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another one. Another one is just a plain advanced air conditioning tune-up, they'll give you up to $205 rebate for just getting your air conditioner tuned up. And again, you have to go to the qualified repair person who knows how to do this to meet the standards to get these rebates. Marshall, how did you find them? Is that in the... Is okay, go to uh, uesaz.com slash efficient home and you'll find it. Thank you. Okay, uh, you also, if you change your refrigerant, there's some that are good and some that are bad. They gave you $70 just to change the refrigerant in your air conditioner. Uh, if you have your coils cleaned in the 
this is indoor coil cleaning for your air conditioner, they'll give you $40. Outdoor coil cleaning, they give you $25. Whatever, Western could, Western cooling, cooling control, they give you $70. All of these are little nickel dime things, but you know, uh, you can make a lot of money from it uh, and, 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 and help, help do this uh, event. My gas bill was like ten dollars last month, uh, and and I, before the heat pump, it was two hundred a month. Oh wow! Okay, mm -hmm. uh, it, that that's the difference. Now I, we use gas for for uh, uh, for for cooking, and that's all. Uh, we also don't have a water heater that heats tw a tank twenty four hours a day. We have an on demand water heater. And I have a solar water heater on the roof, and it only turns on the gas portion to heat uh, when the solar water tank is empty, which is 80 gallons, which takes a long time to empty that. Uh, so I very rarely use any natural gas, for my, which is the backup for the solar water heater. I also have uh, a, a solar two-dimensional tracking system in what I call three solar trees outside in my backyard. And each one has eight panels on it. And they, they're in a rectangle that has a tube on each side of the rectangle, opposite sides of the rectangle. And they're, and they're angled so it rotates around the latitude we are pointing to the North Star. So the tubes on the sides uh, if you can see my hands, the tubes uh, go like this as they heat up and the liquid inside the tube converts from liquid to gas, it rotates the solar system. Mm -hmm. So at sunrise, I'm at maximum and it stays maximum until sunset. Mm -hmm. Where the people who have a rooftop system, if it's at the angle of your latitude, you'll only be peak at noon. I'm peak all day long. But that so, was—I've seen well, your system. You've seen my system. I've seen uh, it; it's gorgeous, but it looked too expensive for me to even consider it. Well, it, it, it I, mine—I actually I, I make money off of it, so I do a Schedule C every year as an energy producer and declare the seventy dollars I make every year as a tax deduction, which means I depreciated the system. <laughs> <laughs> which has a big impact on my taxes. The other thing, and I have, I've had my system for 10 years and I'll give you the numbers for 10 years ago. It cost me $33,000. I got $13,000 back because of the federal tax credit. And the company at that time had a rebate for putting in solar system and I got $10,000 back. So the system actually cost me $10,000 out of my pocket. And when you mm -hmm. add, compare that for, I've used it for 10 years and I've not paid an electric bill at the end of the year, every year I get paid back. Uh, so it's, it's, it's you know, I, I don't pay electricity. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have to pay the, the uh, monthly, uh, monthly uh, uh, charge because I do want to get some electricity at night because I give them more electricity in the daytime than they give me at night. Mm -hmm. because we do things in the daytime, like use our washer and dryers and stuff like that, uh, and not at night. Uh, we're very conservative at our night use of electricity. Uh, and so I, it's the, the I, I, I don't, I don't, that my worst month on, on electricity is January. Why? Mm -hmm. The sun is only up 10 hours a day. In Ju June, it's up 14 hours a day. And so I don't get as much energy from the sun in the winter. The winter is my problem, not the mm -hmm. summer. Everybody think you'd run out of electricity in the summer when you're using your heat pump. No, it's in the winter uh, because the sun's just not up. And we have a little, few more clouds in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's yeah. my worst month. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very, very proud of my, 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 my system. And, and I just think it works. Some other things that I have is that I have an Energy Star white elasomeric painted roof. My father in the 50s uh, ran a, a 
air conditioning company and he found, got out of the air conditioning company and went into the roof painting company because he found out you saved more money with a white elastomeric roof paint than you do that, 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 that reduces your air conditioning bill so that it pays for painting your roof white with a white reflective paint. Because I could walk on my roof with my bare feet. And this is in Florida. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right now, you go on one of these uh, red tile roofs, it, it just radiates heat. Well, what does that do? It goes into the house and makes your air conditioner work harder. So white roof roofs are very, you ought to paint the roads white too. Uh, it reflects the energy and, 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 and reduces the, the uh, energy stuff. Uh, another thing is that when I designed this house 20 years ago, I designed it with a porch on the east, west, and south side so that the sun would come into the windows in the winter, but not in the summer. Uh, so, and I also have energy uh, efficient windows. Uh, I also have roller shutters. If you look behind my, 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 where my finger is, that's a roller shutter uh, that goes down. It has an R rating, which is a insulation rating. Every night I roll to put down the roller shutters and every day I put them up. Uh, mm -hmm. So that the, in the winter, especially because I want the sun to come in and the Winter in the summer, I don't open them up on the north side because I don't want. I, I I play games with my roller shutters mm -hmm. to, to keep the the, the house uh, insulated right. Uh, let's see what else I have. I I have uh, LED lighting. I have natural. I have five uh, natural uh, light fixtures, so I don't need to put my lights on in the daytime because I've got light coming in through the roof. Uh, uh, the thing is that we had to put UV filters on it because it faded things when the sunlight came in. So we actually have ultraviolet filters on our lights to keep our books from uh, fading. Uh, another thing is uh, leaks. Uh, I I've been involved in water rate cases forever. Uh, average home leaks about 14% of its water. And in Arizona, Water is everything. If there's anything that's, that's, that's critical, it's water. And, and water leaks uh, are, are a big problem. And, and getting rid of them are, are hard to handle. But uh, getting rid of them is what you need to do to uh, keep from wasting water. Uh, Marshall? Marshall? Yes, I'll stop. Uh, yeah, no, I... These were all great topics. I've been taking notes, and especially the water leaks, I think might be a, a, even a, another subject for something else. But why don't we let Michael, you know, okay, start, the presentation. Well, and we've got some questions. Oh, we're you still have questions. Still, okay. Still yeah. Questions. yeah, let me run through. Uh, um, question from Angie. How can wood be used for taller buildings without it being a fire head? Wouldn't fire retardants increase other problems? Yeah, good question. So um, essentially the, the answer is that these structural wood beams that are being used in the tall buildings, they, um, they are manufactured, um, and I'm gonna forget exactly what the name of the process is, but they are very, essentially, they're engineered beams that are wood that are pressed together at very mm. high temperatures um, so that it's, it's, it, it increases the strength of the uh, wood greatly and increases the density of the wood greatly. And as a result, um, they surprisingly enough don't burn very well. Um, mm. They actually, in some cases, burn slower than steel um, mm. at, the, at a given temperature. And so, uh, so it's, a, it's a new innovation in, in how you manufacture pro or process wood that allows that kind of thing to happen. It wouldn't have been necessarily possible 100 years ago. Okay, and how about what you were talking about embodied carbon? Uh, what about concrete? Uh, Kathy wonders, is concrete also a material that's considered in, as in, uh, when they look at embodied carbon? Yes, uh, um, concrete is a highly carbon intensive material to manufacture, for sure. Um, and in fact, it's, it's one of the big, if you look at um, the total, I guess the um, the breakdown of different emissions uh, around the world for um, 
emissions that contribute to global warming. You have, you know, energy consumption from coal and from gas. You have uh, land use change. Um, you have building um, materials and especially concrete. Concrete is listed as one of those very large uh, polluting uh, industries, I guess. Um, I don't necessarily have any info on it here, but it is certainly is a big concerning material along the lines of what I'm talking about. I know that there are companies out there that are researching new innovations in concrete so that um, they actually will uh, absorb con uh, carbon uh, over the course of their life. So if you, know, you, you use the energy to make the carbon, excuse me, make the concrete, you install it, and then it is a carbon sink so that it, it um, chemically it's able to absorb carbon. And at the end of its life, it actually is a net negative. So it, it has a positive impact, um, excuse me, a, net, a net positive impact on the, uh, on the global warming picture. I, I, Angie's got her hand up. Angie was yeah, I, I I wanted to ask Michael if he had heard about, I know a couple of years ago when we could still do it, I went to one of these home shows and there was somebody there and I think he was local, if not from Tucson, then definitely from Arizona, who had some kind of process of making concrete cinder blocks and mixing styrofoam in. And apparently, especially in this area, he said it was very good for keeping heat in or keeping heat out type of stuff. Have you seen anything about that? Uh, just to clarify, is it, it's, it's, the styrofoam is chemically mixed into the concrete or is it a, a styrofoam insert kind of sandwich? Mixed in. It's mixed in and I think he was making blocks, you know, cinder blocks that way. Building. I have never seen that before. I've seen oh, okay. um, I've seen cinder blocks that have foam inserts that fit between uh, right, yeah. holes, <laughs> essentially, to provide some insulation value. I've never seen um, cinder blocks that have foam kind of baked into them, if you will. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, it was strange. interesting because it was a good thing to do with styrofoam, which never seems yeah, to yeah. leave yeah, <laughs> the environment that way. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank I'd you. Be to learn more. Okay. Uh, just two more. One was a comment from Guy saying, uh, uh, "Marshall, you and Guy sing the same song." Guy talked about the white reflective paint, and he mentioned that uh, white reflective paint keeps roof temperatures about fifty degrees cooler than non-white roofs, according to the National Renewable Energy Lab. So I think that was just a comment. And then one more question on the heat pump. Uh, does a heat pump use electri less electricity than a traditional air conditioning unit? Do you, do you know? Um, it can. So a heat pump is essentially an air conditioning unit that is run in reverse in the winter. Um, so the infrastructure, the, the refrigerant line is broadly the same, except for a valve that is contained within the condenser that uh, alternates direction of the, of the, of the refrigerant, um, depending on what time of year it is or what, what, and what you want it to do. Um, and so, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, it, just about the relative expense between a heat pump and a regular, for air conditioning and a regular air conditioning unit. The expense. Um, so it totally depends on um, the, the efficiency that it's rated to. So you can have um, a very high efficiency traditional air conditioning unit. Um, it's, it's, um, nowadays it's, it's rated in terms of what they call an, um, a SEER or an IEER um, rating. So um, the minimum federal standard for the SEER rating is 13. So um, SEER 13 or above is what you'll find on the market. A high efficiency would be uh, in the range of 18 or, or even 20. You can have a heat pump that gets you that far, or you can have an AC unit that has um, that SEER rating. Um, it doesn't really matter. So it, it, it's just a question of whether that unit has the capability of heating or not you'll find the efficiency um, roughly the same either way for new model. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the end of the question. Yes, I think we got him. 
Okay, let's finish. Okay, um, not too much more. I, I'm thinking that we will need to pass on the audits portion. Um, yeah, might as well. Unless, unless okay. other have uh, particular questions, but just a little bit more on um, embodied carbon. It might surprise you to, to understand that insulations, um, there's a large variety of insulations that are out there on the market. And some are much more carbon intensive to manufacture than others. Um, so much, some are so carbon intensive that they need to be used sparingly in projects. Um, and if you don't use them sparingly, then the, that actually can have a negative effect um, and offset the savings that you're hoping to gain um, through installing them, ironically enough. So this, this graphic here shows you that. So uh, XPS, the pink, the pink foam insulation that I'm sure you've seen around um, is very carbon intensive to manufacture. Mm. And so um, using too much of it, you might end up um, uh, basically kind of shooting yourself in the foot and, and um, resulting in more or causing more emissions into the atmosphere. Isn't that, isn't that the fiberglass batting? I mean, that's the pink stuff that I, I are you talking right. about that? So that this is fiberglass bat. bat here. Yeah. And this is uh, extruded polystyrene is, is um, XPS. It's a pink uh, foam oh. board. It's a board that comes in sheets of, oh, I don't know, five by eight or so. Um, and it's often used in foundations uh, for to insulate foundations or sometimes walls. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what I'm referring to there. So if you're talking about fiberglass bat that you see in wall cavities, that's down here. It, it still oh. is a negative impact. It, its manufacturing process um, has a has some detrimental impact on uh, climate change, um, not as much as these other ones, other ones though. Mm. So um, that's something that's counterintuitive. I think if you think about mm -hmm. energy efficient buildings, sometimes you think about insulation uh, in the envelope. Uh, picking the right kind of insulation matters uh, because otherwise you're going to uh, set yourself back. In, uh, in your goal to reduce carbon. Nice. So um, this is the audit section. I think, I, like I said, I'm just gonna skip it. Um, so that's that's what I had. I, I went a much longer than I intended. I apologize for that, but I hope that you found it somewhat informative um, and that you learned a little bit um, and I'm happy to answer further questions. Okay, Marshall's got his hand up. Yeah, in 1973, I lived in Los Angeles, and I lived in an old house that was built just after World War II. And in 1973, we had a terrible energy crisis going on, and the utility gave us an, an audit for free, and came out and spent two or three hours and gave us 10 items to, that we could, should look at. The first item was when you looked in the attic, we had a sheet of aluminum foil on top of the uh, batting that was the plaster, and that was the insulation nothing and he said get get it insulated with uh wood uh, i'm sorry newspaper that is thrown out of a, a a nozzle and and it makes an insulation it cost me two hundred dollars to have the whole house insulated with former newspapers that my heating bill and my bills just drop tremendously for almost no cost the most cost efficient thing I've ever seen uh, was, and so that's what got me involved in energy efficiency, is I could mm. see the benefit real fast mm -hmm. from a sheet of aluminum foil to getting rid of old newspapers and making them into pulp and putting them in my attic. That's my comment. Mm -hmm. I have a question, so, honey. Oh. Yeah. Michael, could, would you mind taking down your slide? We could see each other for a oh, sure. conversation. Yeah. Uh, there. If you can. Good. Okay. Yeah. So Marjorie, want to go ahead? Well, it seems like every time you go into a new house, all the, the new flooring is plastic. You go into a furniture store, you see hardly any wood, it's all steel or plastic. So here we are putting all this into our home. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, wood is, we, you can't hardly find wood furniture, except it's, you know, it's so expensive anymore. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, you mentioned steel and plastic. So plastic obviously is is the, the feedstock is fossil is oil. It's it's crude. Yeah. Um, and so anytime you have uh, plastic that you're introducing into your house, that's a, that's a strong embodied carbon. Um, oh, it's it's uh, I guess it's um, it's embodied carbon in the sense that it requires energy to manufacture that crude oil into plastic, but also you're by buying it, you're perpetuating the fossil fuel industry because you're you're giving them a, a, a demand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for steel, yeah, like I mentioned before, steel is is carbon intensive to manufacture as well. Yeah. Are we better with our tile floors in Arizona? In Arizona specifically? Uh, well, that's what mostly we have here before we start putting plastic on top. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if I have a direct answer for that right now, but um, I would say that tile floors, like a, like a porcelain or a, um, ceramic, um, they have the advantage of, of being able to absorb a lot of heat during the day. And as Connie mentioned earlier, um, if you have a tile floor that is uh, exposed to sunlight, then it, it, during the daytime, it picks up that heat. And at the nighttime, it releases it again. So right. that the tiles um, have a benefit of, of helping to heat your house. Oh, um, and cool your house. I did house. not know this. Somebody in one of the classes, the Ollie classes, turned me on to it. Um, m- because I have tile floors in there in the summertime, even well into the summer, those floors are cool. And so if you put a air, if you put a little fan so that it blows across your tile floor and onto you sitting on the couch watching TV or whatever you're doing, you're gonna have to get a little blanket, even if you have your air conditioner like I do set at 80 degrees, because mm-hmm. coming off that floor is, I mean, that's great, that's great air. So that's, a, that's the other way we can use it here is put a little fan and blow it into your sitting space in the mm-hmm. summertime. Mm-hmm. Probably speaking, um, it's true that they've done studies that indicate if, if your feet are a certain temperature, then you're, then you're, all, you're all set, you're comfortable. So um, <laughs> if you cool feet, yeah. yeah, if you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> winter, if your feet are warm, if the floors are warm in the winter, then you're, mm-hmm. you're feeling good. If the floors are cool in the summer, then you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, uh, Marshall and I both are have our hands up, but Marshall's was up first, so we'll let him go first. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. You're you're muted. Maybe I can do it. I, I didn't have. Uh, I didn't take it down. Am I mistaken? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, let me ask this. Um, in the east, and this is for Sherry too. Is there, (laughs) it seems like promoting everybody doing energy efficiency would be a really smart thing for us to do. Is it already being done on the East Coast? Is there anything that, you know, you have seen communities do? I mean, we started on this just figuring, well, we'll inform ourselves and then we'll figure out what we can do to get it promoted in our various communities up and down the I-17 here. We still don't really know, you know, is it letters to the editor? I mean, is it talking to individual communities? I mean, have you seen anything that communities have done that seems to work? Is that... I, I can I can start. Yeah, I think, Michael, Cherry, anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean I, I would think I would go back to the um what I mentioned before about Bo- the city of Boston and the various towns around the Boston area that have implemented zoning requirements for, for lead certification. So basically that means anybody who wants to develop a property over a certain threshold of size must achieve lead certification. As part That's of their- new buildings, right? I mean, so that is one thing we can do in Santa Cruz County because Santa Cruz County passed all of the most updated building inspection requirements, except for energy efficiency. And they left those. They said, well, we have so many owner builders around here. It's really hard. So that is something we could do in Santa Cruz County is start putting pressure on the county to update that. But you know, we're thinking about all these existing homes and we know that 
an energy efficient home is a more comfortable home as well as has cheaper operating costs. I mean, does anybody have any ideas about the best way forward on this? And I see a couple hands up. Uh, uh, just go ahead and say something if you're pretty, Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> couple of things. Well, I, when I was looking at ahead at some of this stuff, you know, what came up was Juneau, Alaska, uh, which is not a really a big city. It's more like a big town, <laughs> as I recall. But they had a program. It was to have people convert to uh, heat pumps. And uh, it said one of the reasons was that oil was very expensive in Alaska, but electricity was not expensive in Alaska. So um, you know, people converting from oil heat to a heat pump, you know, was good for them individually and it was good for emissions and all of that. So, uh, but they had some money to help people. People could apply for money to make this conversion and they were doing so many a month and, you know, so there are local things. But my, my hand was up, it's sort of the big, I guess the, what can we do locally? And what's the big question? It looks like these regulations are, city by city or maybe county by county. It's like, are there any, is there any federal oversight? You know, and even looking at those different, this is, uh, I, I, nobody has an answer, I'm sure. <laughs> looking at those different insulations and how one is so bad and, and another kind is much better. Is anybody telling people you're not allowed to use that very bad pink insulation anymore? I mean, is it, who, who makes the rules? doesn't look like there's any particular oversight. It's up to the builders and builders being educated and wanting to do the, the best thing. Seems. Well, and it, it also has to do with the cost of materials because they're probably trying to balance, yeah, you know, sure. uh, cost. And yeah. But I wonder if that pink stuff he was talking about is just fairly inexpensive for what it does. So it, it gets it, used a lot. I don't know. Marshall, is that something you know about? Yeah, the, the uh, county has the building inspectors and yeah. they follow the code. And the problem is the code is deficient in many areas, in uh -huh. particular in the energy area. And mm -hmm. the board of supervisors refuses to use the new, whatever, I don't know the name of the present standard, but the latest standard for energy efficiency. Uh, there's an international code. Uh, it's a basic code. It's a basic building code. And if they used it, the new buildings would be better. The problem is they're afraid that the contractors uh, will cost more money to build the house. Yeah. The problem is the cost in building the house might be 5%, but you're going to save 25% mm -hmm. in your utility bills. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and num that's number one. Number two, the contractors don't know how to build. Uh, they don't know. When I first ordered a, a solar system, I gave my contractor one, one requirement that it'd be able to plug into the grid. And six months later, they didn't know how to plug into the grid. So I canceled my contract. Uh, it's not a big deal, but it's one thing that I would expect when I bought a solar system. Granted, that was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, 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 thing, the education, the training level of the building inspectors and of the builders is a major problem. And mm -hmm. if we could get both of those in sync and modern and using whatever, I don't know the name of the international building code, but if they were using the right building code uh, that Michael I'm sure could tell us about, then I know we'd be on the right track. And I think getting the supervisors, the board of supervisors that, that approves the code on track will help us all. And, and same thing in Pima County. Pima County is much more progressive than Santa Cruz County. I mean, mm -hmm. we're in the dark age. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pima County is much better about this. Well, Marshall, you and I ought to see if we can't uh, find some other people to work with us and uh, start working with the county and get that, get that fixed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, that's ridiculous. I know there's at least a, a couple of architects that are, have been crazy about this for 10 years so we, mm. we would get support and the time is right for that now especially if we're talking about i mean here's michael talking about getting rid of all your um gas 
uh, appliances is that the, your stove and your mm -hmm. hot, hot water heater, way cheaper to do it right to begin with than it is to fix it later. So that's a... And, and we have, um, I may even have heard of this, you know, then we have our Arizona legislature, which will sometimes has rules like you can't, you know, they'll make a rule. Municipalities, counties are not allowed to make a law that bans plastic bags. Yeah, yeah. bans plastic bags yeah. or has to have that each new home has to have a, whatever you call the, the thing so you can plug your electric car in. You know, there's that other level of um, they're doing things like that. So, yeah. So, how to plug in to advocate and who to talk to. Well, it looks like you, you two in Santa Cruz County have an idea. Well, it's, uh, it's something we can do, but I wish that, um, I, you know, and, and Connie and I, we really need to take, we've got about eight more minutes. We really need to take a little bit of time here and talk about where we go forward because we do not have a next speaker planned. We need to um, spend a few we need to figure out where to go next. And mm -hmm. we can make a decision. There's nine of us here. Well, there's seven of us if we count <laughs> uh, Mike Sherry. and Sherry as uh, honored guests, but probably not too involved in what we do next meeting. But I mean, what do we do? Do we just have a big a discussion again about where we go from here? Mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, I need to head out. I need yeah, to Michael, this is my, great. This was, it was absolutely fabulous, Michael. It was a Thank great presentation. So and we will, really we will have it recorded for people who didn't yep. show up asking them to yep. play it. So great. thank you so much. You, you put a lot everything. into this. Learned something and, um, and best of luck. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I, again, I can't speak to Arizona, but anything I talked about, I, I can uh, feel a question or two. Um, best of luck. I'm looking forward to hearing okay. about your progress. Well, I would like okay. to keep in touch with you. I yeah. might even ask you a question or two, but thank you, Michael. This was yeah, we really learned a interesting lot. and helped kind of give us the big picture about mm -hmm. what it is we need to be thinking about. And we needed that. Okay. okay. I hope so, right? That's yeah. great. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.